Some Light Podcast. This program contains preaching and teaching from an Orthodox Christian perspective to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and to be victorious in Him. Well, good uh, good afternoon. It's 4 o'clock Tuesday on W4CY, and I'm your show host, Dr. L. Manch, and uh, broadcasting from the uh, beautiful chapel of St. Peter and Paul Orthodox Chapel. Uh, the show is blessed by uh, Patriarch Michael of the uh, Ukrainian International Orthodox Church, which we have an international uh, you know, impact on the world, especially in Africa and uh, so forth, you know, Congo, uh, in uh, Kenya, and so forth. So the, uh, the jurisdiction I just mentioned uh, under the Patriarch is expanding in Africa, and I say glory to God for that. So, uh, our slogan, our show slogan for Old Blast and Light is Preparing Souls for Heaven. So this is a teaching tool uh, to, first of all, uh, give you knowledge and prepare you for uh, uh, coming events. And today's show topic is, is called The Great Reset. The Great Reset. You say, well, what is that? So I'm going to go into a little definition of explaining what The Great Reset is, and then we're going to press on from there. The Great Reset is a, is a proposal by the World Economic Forum to rebuild the economy sustainably following the COVID-19 pandemic. It was unveiled in May 2020 by the United Kingdom's Prince Charles and the WEF, that would be the World Economic Forum Director Klaus, Klaus Schwab. So, let me give, go on a little bit more about this. The world is run by and for billionaires. Maybe you don't like to hear that. Uh, everything I'm telling you is available. If you go online and search this out, The Great Reset, you can read, uh, educate yourself on what's going on. Uh, the world is run by and for billionaires. If you prefer to be run democratically, for all of us, then don't be fooled by the Great Reset. A request by the corporate and financial sectors for governments to give them taxpayers money to take more control. Okay, so here's an article I want to read about uh, this Great Reset. Uh, July 29, 2020, so it's kind of fresh. The club of the world, world's richest people and the largest nature of destroying corporations wants the Great Reset. Instead of poverty, disease, and overpopulation and destruction of nature, the mega-rich promised us a fair world in harmony with nature. Despite its obvious absurdity and cynicism behind it, this initiative should not be ignored. There is a dark plan behind it. According to its own description, the World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private co cooperation and has its main objective to improve the state of the world. The foundation, founded in 1971 by German economist Klaus Schwab, lacks neither power nor self-confidence. For years now, almost all the world's major heads of the governments have made the pilgrimage to the annual meeting in Davos to pay their respects to the multinational corporations and billionaires. The World Bank, a close uh, a uh, collaborator of the forum has made it a strategy to only support development projects that the member companies of this club can earn, earn money from. The United Nations ha have been made highly dependent on the money of the corporations and can do practically nothing that does not promote their interests or even runs counter to them. Even the International Monetary Fund called the IMF now acts quite unabashedly as a door opener for multinationals when it is supposed to help a poor country in difficulty or assess its financial system. And I, I know that I'm getting long-winded on the description of the Great Reset, but this is necessary uh, for me to move into the next part of the show. Now what could possibly be wrong with this? The plot, it, 
It depends on the underlying agenda, does it not? It depends upon the answer to these questions. What is the guiding purpose behind the necessity to lock down the world, to convince everyone that 7 billion people need to be vaccinated, that health passports will be necessary, that cash will, be, uh, will need to be abolished, that everyone will require a digital identity because it is a human right to be able to prove who you are. These things slowly but surely are being projected by our politicians, by our media, by philanthropists like Bill Gates. We all know who Bill Gates is. Onto our TV sets, into our social media, into our mindset, as things which are inevitable, it's happening. So don't be, uh, don't put your head in the sand on this. It's happening. And to me, it sounds like the one world government coming to play. And now what does, what does Holy Scripture say about the one world uh, government? Well, I'm going to do some uh, reading out of Holy Scripture uh, as, as we open the show up here. And uh, so uh, please be attentive. In Revelation chapter 13, the uh, first 18 verses, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head, heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like a bear's, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave, gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but his mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth, keyword, the whole earth marveled as they followed, they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, which is three and a half years. So all you Bible scholars out there, and your end time people, uh, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Also, Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, these are of one mind, and they hand over their power to the authority of the beast. Revelation 13, I go on a little bit. And it and it also it causes all both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast and or of the number of its name and we know 666 is that number so what is god doing about all this you know we we serve a holy god and and, and that god loves his creation doesn't he well let's see what's happening here uh, there's a clue in second thessalonians chapter 2 therefore god sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness and unrighteousness is uh, the opposite of righteousness not doing what God says do that's unrighteousness back to second thought let's stuff is only in chapter 2 again now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ our being gathered together with him we ask you brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind, okay, this is to the church now, be, be not shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So there's going to be fake news, there's going to be false stories coming out. We need to be as wise uh, as serpents, you know, that meek as lambs, as it tells us in Scripture. Let no one deceive you in any way. It said, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, that day, that big day will not come unless a rebellion comes first. There has to be a rebellion first. And that man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. He tried that once in heaven. He says, I will ascend to the throne, I will be God, and God says, I will have none of this, and he fell like lightning to this earth. Just read it in scriptures. 
Now, here's a comforting. Now, it's going to be troubling upon this, this earth. But Philippians 3.20 gives us hope. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await this, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we're going to have to bring Jesus Christ into the formula now. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth, first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so we know there's only one person that is able to break the seals, the, the, the scroll that we read in Revelation. There's nobody that can break the seals except our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that has power to break the seals and start the, the tribulation and turmoil on the earth. See, the, Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And so I'm going to move this, this uh, the, from the one world government, uh, from the Great Reset, which are trying to push this one world government. It's going to go. It's going to happen because Scripture talks about it, and we need to be prepared as believers in Christ uh, of the of the future that we have a future if we're hidden in Christ. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and why it is so important. He said, well, I don't understand how the resurrection of Christ uh, is uh, relevant to the Great Reset. Well, you just sit back, relax, enjoy this next few minutes of the show and uh, be able to relish uh, the truth of why the resurrection is so important for us as the Great Reset is coming upon us. In Christian theology, the death and resurrection of Jesus are the most important events, a foundation of the Christian faith, and commemorated by Pascha for Christians. His resurrection is the guarantee that all Christians dead will be resurrected at Christ's second coming. What if we put in the grave will not stay in the grave. It will come out. Uh, just as he said to the, uh, to the two witnesses laying in, in Jerusalem, dead, he says, come up here. And what did they do? They came up there. So that's the word, the Logos, the word of God. Now, Orthodox Christians believe that the New Testament church and the Christian faith itself appeared at a particular point in history because the crucified Christ of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, was raised from the dead. And we still see that evidence uh, today. All you have to do is go to Jerusalem and go to the Holy Sepulcher on Pascha, the Saturday before you know midnight, and you'll see a miracle happen. It's called the Holy Fire when uh, the Holy Spirit comes and the church is darkened. There's no open flames anywhere. And all of a sudden, all the candles and all the candelies, all the uh, oil lamps light up in a miraculous way. And the Patriarch of Jerusalem will come out of the sepulcher with uh, candles burning, uh, announcing a uh, Christ is risen from the dead, tramping down death by death, and, and bidding the, the worshipers to come and receive the unwaning light. Now, for this cause, this cause, the cause behind the emergence of the church and the Christian faith was not a crucified dead and buried Jesus, rather that the very crucified dead and buried Jesus was revealed to be both Lord and Christ following his resurrection on the third day, which is part of our Nicene Creed, which we uh, repeat many uh, every time we have liturgy or divine services, we always uh, recite the Nicene Creed. 
God vindicated the messianic claims of Jesus when he raised Jesus from the dead according to the scriptures. Contemporary Orthodox Christians readily agree with the Apostle Paul's insistence on the absolute centrality of the bodily resurrection of Christ as a foundation of the Christian faith in Jesus. If Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain and our preaching is vain because you are still dead in your sins and trespasses if Christ not be raised. It comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Among all the Christians, this has been an overwhelming consensus since the initial witness of the apostles to the risen Lord. But since the emergence of critical, bi critical uh, biblical scholars within the last two centuries or so, we find Christian scholars and those influenced by them questioning, reinterpreting, or openly denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what I call the apostate or the great falling away. For the members of the first Christian community in Jerusalem, the resurrection of Christ was above all an event in the life of their master and also in their own lives. After meeting Christ following his resurrection, they could have said with St. Paul that necessity was laid upon them to preach the gospel of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Uh, Paul goes to the Greeks in Acts. And he says to the to the Greeks, and, he, and he, he's talking about Jesus Christ. And they were listening intently. They always wanted to hear a new thing or a new teaching or, or a new religion or whatever. But as soon as he said uh, a resurrection, they scoffed at him. And they says, uh, we'll hear you uh, later on this matter. And they all got up and left. So that's the, the resurrection of Christ is a dividing line. Christianity spread throughout the Greco-Roman world with the proclamation that Jesus, who died on the cross, was raised to a new life by God. The message of Christianity is without parallel in religious history in its content and its demand. The risen Christ spoke to the disciples about belief in his resurrection, even among those who did not see him as those, for those very first disciples did. This was in response to the Apostle Thomas's movement from unbelief to belief when Jesus appeared to Thomas and offered him, put thy hands, thy finger into thy wounds, and thy hand into thy side. Now, he says, you have believed because you have seen, but more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, John 20, 29. Clearly, the presence of faith is essential in confessing that Jesus had, has been raised from the dead. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Next, basic gospel teaching out of Romans chapter 10, verse 9. However, in perhaps challenging a misconceived understanding of faith, this does not mean that believing that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead is an irrational leap into an unbelievable and indefensible. On the one hand, the resurrection is an overwhelming and awesome event that invokes trembling and astonishment in those who are presented with its reality and perhaps initial silence because of its numinous, uh, numinous quality. And you go look at Mark 16, 8. Of course, you know there are going to be people. Uh, at the, you know, I'm going to talk about in a minute. In a minute, who uh, said, "Well, they stole the body. He was in soul sleep, and so forth." Uh, but uh, uh, there's there's more evidence that the man's a verdict here as, as I go deeper into the study on the resurrection. Resurrection is the claim that the body, and thus the whole person conceived biblically has been raised and glorified to a new mode of existence in an eternal relationship with God the Father. What many Jews believed would occur at the end of history happened with Jesus within history. And that is why the Apostle Paul called Christ the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20. Now, you know, if you read the scriptures intently and do your studies, you'll know that uh, what what it means to have first fruits. That Jesus is our first fruits. 
He's the first one born from the dead. And and now look, okay, who else? Of all the worldly religions we have, uh, which which uh, religion can boast that uh, their savior, their God, who was raised from the dead, is only one, and that's Christianity. And 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 as I'm talking about the resurrection of Christ, it was the, it's the only religion that the savior resurrected. The rest are still in the ground, buried. So while we see the risen Lord through the eyes of faith, we also claim that the historical investigation into the reliability of the, of the evidence for the resurrection narrated and developed in the New Testament cannot refute that belief in any way. I hope you're really listening intently to uh, what I'm saying here because uh, this stuff, uh, this is important because the Great Reset is coming. And are you either going to be for it or against it? In Christianity, there exists a mutual interpenetration between theology and history. Big word, interpenetration between theology and history. Thus, theology and history remain in an unbreakable bond of mutual support and clarification. Basically, Christians cannot make theological claims that are historically untenable or refutable. This is due to the foundational claim that God acts decisively on behalf of humankind and the world within the historical space and time of our created world. Now you know that God doesn't have to deal with that, but that's why Jesus took on flesh from a woman, from a virgin, Holy Theotokos, and dwelt among us for, for that 33 some years. Uh, he became part of the created world, but never left his Godhead. He was the God-man. With this in mind, we can say that there are three essential components to the New Testament's proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that together present a reasonable defense of that claim that is simultaneously consistent, coherent, and convincing. So the three things are this. The discovery of an empty tomb. Two, the appearance of the risen Lord to his male and female disciples. And three, the transformation of the disciples into the apostles who boldly proclaim the risen Christ to the world and the beginning of the New Testament church. You think about it, all the apostles except for one met a martyr's death because they would not shut up about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Now if they were, if they were purporting a lie, that doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, why would somebody give their life up for uh, telling a fable? Uh, the only one that, that died a natural death was John, uh, you know, the beloved of Christ, who was exiled on Patmos, who wrote, uh, you know, Gospel of John, the three letters of John, and also he wrote uh, the Revelation. Okay, let's talk about the empty tomb. Christians believe that the tomb of Jesus Christ must have been empty for them to convincingly announce his resurrection from the dead. The empty tomb in itself simply revealed the fact that something happened to the body of the crucified Christ. The empty tomb needs to be interpreted. Not expecting the resurrection of her master Mary Magdalene's first reaction was to seek a natural interpretation. For the empty tomb, she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him, John chapter 20, verse 2. That the tomb of the dead Jesus was found empty on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, in the Greek we say Kyriaki, the Lord's day, Following his crucifixion and burial is now universally acknowledged as a sound historical fact. I mean, there were even pagans, Roman soldiers and so forth it attested to this. Even Josephus, the Jewish scholar, wrote it down and attested to it. Scholars who do not believe in the resurrection of Christ accept the account of the burial of Jesus and the discovery of the empty tomb. 
a former Roman Catholic and, and, and Jesus scholar, Geza Vermes, offers a good example of this basic consensus. When every argument has been considered and weighed, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the opinions of the orthodox, liberal, sympathizer, and the critical agnostic alike, and even perhaps of the disciples themselves, are simply interpretations of the one disconcerting fact, namely that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation not a body but an empty tomb. And of course, no one has ever claimed to have produced the corpse of Jesus. Whatever one may make of St. Matthew's account in 20, uh, chapter 27, verses 62 through 66, it is clear that the propaganda concerning why the tomb of Jesus was discovered to be empty presupposes the acceptance of the empty tomb in the first place. The counterclaim of the Jewish authorities, the stolen body of Jesus, was another appeal to a natural, to a natural reason as to why the tomb was empty. But the appearance of the angels, remember they encountered the angels within the tomb, recorded by all four, all four evangelists, begins to point well beyond these natural explanations into the mysterious realm of God. For it is God who acted in both an ex unexpected and also shatteringly decisive way by transforming the tomb into a womb from which emerges new and everlasting life. In fact, in the Orthodox Church, is we say that his tomb has become our bridal chamber. It was the woman disciples of Jesus who first heard the gospel of new life from within the tomb. As prominent New Testament scholars such as Raymond Brown, uh, New Testament Wright and Williams Lane Craig further point out the discovery of the tomb by a group of women, the holy myrrh bearers who we call in the church, is a very convincing piece of evidence for the veracity of the canonical gospels account of the initial discovery of the empty tomb. This is because the witness of women was not binding according to the law in the first century of Judaism. But remember, after they went and told the apostles, they came running and went in and checked. The early church would not have imaginatively given the privilege of discovering the empty tomb to witnesses who unfortunately were thought to be unreliable. In fact, According to Luke 24, 11, the apostles initially thought that their words were an idle tale. Did the apostles ever get anything right until they saw the risen Lord and began to believe in him? They always were, he would always say, oh, oh you of no faith, oh, oh, you of little faith, how long shall I strive with you? Uh, I mean, the Lord uh, probably got uh, concerned about, you know, he's giving the, par the definition of the parables uh, uh, to his apostles, and they still were like uh, chunks of wood. Trying to get that into their spirit. With the proclamation of the angel from within the tomb, we are introduced into the good news, which has changed the world once and for all. Do not be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And that comes out of Mark 16 verses 6 and 7. This sets the stage for the appearances of the risen Christ to his, apostles, his disciples. Now I want to stop there and just say one thing. After Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, remember uh, during the actual crucifixion and the death of, of the Lord on the cross that there was an earthquake and darkness and all that and, and the tombs of the saints broke open and they rolled out. And uh, remember I talked about first fruits? Jesus is the first fruit of the dead. 
Why, well, after his resurrection, he raised those uh, saints that rolled out of the tombs and, and I believe presented them to the Father as a first fruit offering, as he was a first fruit offering, the first one born of the dead. Remember, he was, Jesus walked this earth for 40 days after his resurrection. He didn't go, he didn't just disappear right after his resurrection. He stayed on this planet in some form for 40 days. Now the appearances of the Lord, the risen Lord, very important I say the risen Lord, the appearance of the risen Christ provide the needed interpretation to the empty tomb. The tomb is indeed empty because Jesus has been raised from the dead as the angel proclaimed, this is the dawn of the new creation and of the death of death. Each gospel ends with at least one chapter there are two in St. John, narrating one or more appearances of the risen Lord to his female and male disciples. These appearances initially overwhelmed the disciples, and we hear of different reactions, gladness, worship, even doubt. But in a marvelous expression in St. Luke's Gospel, we even hear that the disciples disbelieved for joy in Luke 24, 41. There is also initial non-recognition in some accounts in Luke 24, 16 and John 20, 14. Remember uh, the men walking uh, on the road to Emmaus and then Jesus joins up with them and they start talking and he's kind of questioning them and he says, you know, he says, what happened in Jerusalem? He says, are you that much of a stranger? You don't know what happened in Jerusalem of how Jesus Christ was crucified and buried and so forth. And now uh, they find themselves when they when they stop for, for supper, uh, as the Lord uh, blessed the food, uh, their hearts were open and they realized it was the risen Christ. And of course he disappeared at that moment. And that was on the, the road to Emmaus. The sheer unexpectedness of the crucified, but now risen Lord appearing to his disciples must account for some of these reactions. Yet, Regardless of these initial reactions, the disciples are completely convinced that it is Jesus raised to new life and now in their midst as their Lord and God. And that's what, that's what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's what he said when he encountered the risen Christ. And I hope that when you encounter the risen Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you can say, my Lord and my God. From our vantage point today, it is virtually impossible for us to comprehend this experience of the first disciples of Christ. The resurrection of Christ was and remains a mysterious, unprecedented, and eschatological event. Eschatological event. Big Greek word. Eschatologia. Perhaps what that is what accounts for the lack of of that narrative flow and continuity we encounter in the narrative of the suffering, death, and burial of Christ. The evangelists were hard pressed to relate the unrelatable within the confines of their own human language and images. At times it seems as if language itself breaks down in, in its struggle to narrate the events of the, of the appearances of Christ. And I think about, I think about St. Paul who went into the third heaven. And he didn't know if it was bodily or in a dream or what. But when he was up there, he, 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 didn't, he didn't want to come back. He, the Lord said, no, you're not done. you got to come back. And people asked him about it. And he, and, uh, he said, it was so marvelous, I can't even put it into words what I saw in heaven. I has not seen, ear has not heard of what awaits those who are truly his in the heavenly, heavenly realm, the kingdom. Because we're getting ready, you know, to be with Christ and, and be at the great banquet. For we discover in the risen Lord both continuity and discontinuity. It is, to, it is the crucified, dead, and buried Jesus himself who is raised from the dead. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, a fact borne out by his still visible wounds, and that even takes food together with the disciples. So he looks, you know, he's resurrected and he's resurrected in power, but he sits there and he, and he can eat 
just like you and I would physically sit down and eat a meal, he can do that in resurrection power. Yet there is a lot of great deal of transformation in the risen Lord. He appears and disappears at will, and closed doors are not obstacles to those appearances. St. Mark even informs us that he appeared in another form. When we take into account the complementary aspects of continuity and discontinuity revealed in the risen Lord, then to speak of his physical resurrection can be misleading to and open to skeptical, skeptical dismissal. This is because a physical resurrection can be misconstrued as a mere resuscitation and hence resumption of earthly existence as we experience it in the here and now of this world. And that was the case when Jesus raised to life the daughter of Jairus, Jairus, the son of the widow of Nain, and even his dear friend Lazarus. They all died again after being brought back to life by the restorative power of Christ. The Lord, however, was resurrected to undying and eternal life, never to die again. Wasn't resuscitated, he was resurrected. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him, Romans 6, 9. And we even say, uh, trampling down death by death. We say that in the divine liturgy. For this reason is much more biblical sound to speak of the bodily resurrection of Christ so as to maintain the essential distinction between resurrection on the one hand and mere resuscitation on the other hand that they may be attached to the term physical. The term bodily will also serve to strengthen the reality of the transformation that occurs in the resurrection for the Lord is raised from death in a spiritual body according to the theological nuance expression of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 50. Raised to life in a spiritual body, the risen Lord reveals to us the glorified life of the age to come. He's the trailblazer, isn't he? He's the first among equals. He, he's, he, re he was raised from the dead. The first to be raised from the dead. In theological language, we refer to this as an eschatological reality. This means an event reserved for the end of history being disclosed within history. And by grace, we will share this with the Lord in the life of the world to come. The word grace. We, because of the risen Christ, we now can participate with him. In, the, in his grace. We can't be Christ, we can be like Christ, and he will give us the grace, the power to be like him. What is being stressed here, however, is that the disciples know that it is Jesus, once they see him following his resurrection, this is all summed up by St. Luke in the second volume of his narrative history of Christ's ministry and the beginning of the church's existence. To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. That's Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Now, because of the of resurrection of Christ, and because of the apostles seeing this and witnessing of the risen Christ, there's a transformation that takes place of the, whole, of the disciples and the beginning of the New Testament church. Remember, uh, a New Testament cannot be ratified unless uh, the tester, Jesus Christ, dies. And, and we, re we recount that every divine liturgy when we have the consecration of the body and blood of Christ. Something has to account for the evident transformation of Christ's disciples. They are portrayed in the Gospels in a painfully unflattering manner, based not only on their obtuseness during the ministry of Christ,
but also on their cowardly falling to remain with him in the hour of his suffering and death they took off remember they Peter was challenged he denied him three times then that cock crowed and then Peter wept bitterly but received forgiveness did he from the Lord he didn't have to do, do like Judas Iscariot did he had sell the Lord for 30 pieces of silver and then they wouldn't take it back then he went out and bought a potter's field with the money because of blood money and then Judas in his, in his uh, trouble uh, of his mind his heart one hung himself and the branch, the branch broke and he fell down in, into the earth and busted open He has forgiveness with the Lord. Isn't that amazing? We can have forgiveness with the Lord. If we repent, confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us. Wipe the slate clean. At the very heart of that gospel was that Jesus had overcome death itself by His resurrection, thus inaugurating a new creation and the promise of eternal life with God. But God raised Him up, having loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it, Acts 2.24. He could not go into corruption. Crushed by the brutal and cursed death of their master and together with them, him, of their hope that Jesus was the Messiah, fearful and hiding behind closed doors for the fear of the Jews, John verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 19, the Messianic movement centered in Jesus was at was as dead as he apparently was lying in the tomb. A crucified, dead, and buried Messiah was not only meaningless, but completely incoherent from the Jewish perspective. Something of great significance must have happened to make any sense of the disciples' newfound faith, boldness, and finally, willingness to give their own lives for what they would proclaim to the world. Conspiracies and other collective hallucinations are in explanations that are now treated as more or less eccentric theories. Most of these theories cancel each other out so one is left with one choice or another. In their desire to maintain objectivity but also to make some sense of the evidence provided to them, historians and scholars must face this historically unprecedented and baffling mystery of the origins of the Christian movement for all of the data tells us that this movement should have never even started. When they carefully examine the evidence and try to come to some conclusion as to the foundational cause of this new faith centered in Jesus of Nazareth, a condemned criminal put to death by the authority of the Roman Empire in the relatively remote and insignificant area of the first century Judea, these very historians and scholars must provide a convincing alternative theory if they are not willing to accept the claim that Jesus was raised from the dead. I hope you're listening intently to this. Very important it's, uh, that we grasp the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A fair question then forms itself naturally, taking into account the beliefs of the first century Judaism concerning the possibility of a crucified Messiah issues of life after death and the Jewish belief in the resurrection from the dead at the end of time just how convincing are, are any of those alternative theories but you know uh, when the New Testament church started most of them were, were uh, Jewish people most of them were, were converts the Jewish converts came into Christianity perhaps this is why the major New Testament scholars such as E.P. Sanders without committing themselves to an active faith in the resurrection of Christ, or at least conceding that the disciples of Christ were convinced that they saw him alive following his death on the cross, and that they acted on that conviction. To return to an initial point, I do not believe that Christians should attempt to compel faith in Christ by a careful gathering of the evidence concerning Christ's resurrection from the dead. This is not a courtroom trial. And Christian faith is not based upon the jury's verdict. A commitment to Christ as a crucified and risen one who was trampled down death by death and upon those in the tombs of sowing life begins with faith based on trusting the witness of the apostles of Christ, a witness for which they were prepared, they were prepared to die for. 
this trust slowly begins to transform each Christian, transforms each Christian so that so that faith is a living and personal faith and that faith matures all Christians may reach a point when they can make their make their own words of the Apostle Paul we all should be able to say this I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and it comes under Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 Yet the Christian claim is that the good that God acts within human history, that God enters into the into the time and space of our world to create, sustain, and redeem us as the Lord of history, who has prepared a glorious future for us. The ultimate manifestation of that bodily divine activity within the world is revealed in the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, and his death and resurrection from the dead fulfills the, the promises of God and he remains faithful to his faithless people throughout history. In the Orthodox Church, the resurrection is not merely the feast of feasts, but the all-embracing feast, which is the soul of all others and, and is always present in them. In it we find all the divine and theanthropic, theo, theanthropic, God-loving powers of the Savior, which crush every sin, every death, every devil, unceasing resurrection, that is continuous resurrection is precisely what the life of all orthodox christians in the church of the savior is it is my life your life and that each of us so what is the orthodox church it is the risen christ who lives forever so we who live in it continually overcome sin death and the devil through the risen christ you can't do it on your own in this way we raise ourselves from every grave lead and guided are always in this task by the saints whom we praise every day these are the true victors over death sin and the devil through the risen lord and are at the same time are those who raise us from our graves because what is the aim of the christian life to defeat sin death and the devil and thus to guarantee immortality and eternal life in the heavenly kingdom of the love of christ because victory over any one of our sins is a victory over death since every sin is our spiritual death and i talked about the leprosy of sin last sunday by overcoming sin and death we in reality we defeat the devil since but the devil is a being in whom sin and death are identical but we people are human only through the resurrection of the god man our lord jesus christ and through his form and through his form of immortality because sin and death Oh, the devil cannot take Christ our God away from us, nor his justice, immortality, and eternity, if we ourselves consciously do not want this. That is, provided we keep Christ our God within us with faith, prayer, love, patience, fasting, humility, and with other gospel virtues, the invisible armor of our God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. So I've I've said all this to uh, prepare you for the great reset. It's coming. And if you're found hidden in Christ, it won't make a difference because your, your life, this is not your home. We are, am, we are aliens passing through. And in the great reset, when the whole world goes crazy, we, trusting in Christ, the risen Christ, have a home that's not made with human hands. Heaven. May we all be on that path of holiness that leads to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Ogladsome Light Podcast. We hope this program has encouraged you to fight the good fight of faith and walk in the accordance with the commandments of our Lord. May God bless you on your journey to salvation. Jesus Christ,